On game night, there's only one food delivery service that's a real slam dunk. Grubhub's got you covered with game time eats, late night treats, lazy lunches, family dinners, and more. It's all on Grubhub. And now Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free. So you pay zero delivery fees when you order. Visit goforgrubhub.com slash Amazon for details. And with the holidays right around the corner, Grubhub gift cards are the perfect gift for everyone on your list. Download the Grubhub app today. Go for Grubhub. Cartier, Rolex, Gucci, Prada, Jordan, Adidas, Bottega Veneta. At eBay, it's real or it's getting the fake out. eBay's team of luxury authenticators make sure that you never get faked over. Watches inspected by watch aficionados, sneakers checked by legit sneakerheads, handbags examined by handbag connoisseurs, and jewelry in the scopes of expert gemologists. The details inspected, the fakes rejected. Ensure your next purchase is the real deal with eBay's authenticity guarantee. Everyone deserves real. Visit ebay.com for terms. You're listening to 100 Words or Less with Ray Harkins. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for downloading this podcast. I will always thank you at the top of the show because, let's be honest, there are so many things that you could be doing with your time, but you decide to spend it with me and my guest and this podcast, and that is meaningful to me. So I hope you take that seriously. The guest this week is Greg Anderson. He is, in my mind, an absolute legend. He plays in band, or he played in a band called Engine Kid. He also played in the legendary uh, straight edge hardcore band from Seattle called Brotherhood. Uh, he also is the proprietor and owner of Southern Lord Records and also plays in Sun. The dude has done so much. And when the opportunity came up to me to have him on the show, I was like, I would love to. And we get in it <laughs> because engine kid actually just released a six LP box set for record store day. And you can find that, uh, you know, wherever you may buy records, you probably have to do a little searching now. Cause I know that, uh, you know, it sold pretty well from what I can tell, but, um, yeah, it just, I, I love when people are active over so many years within the context of independent music, because, it gives people the chance to explore so many different sides of themselves. Like, you know, to, to say that uh, you could understand where Sun came from by listening to Brotherhood, <laughs> like, you can't, you can sort of draw that straight line, but sonically, it's just two completely different worlds. And I love that about our awesome independent music scene. So, as always, you can email the show 100 words podcast at gmail.com. Please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, it helps the show out tremendously. I know. Everybody asks you to do that, but just hop on there. It'll take you less than a minute, write a few sentences, toss a few stars this general direction. I would appreciate it immensely. And uh, it's been wild to watch shows starting to come back. (laughs) It's just, I don't know, it's something that is, it feels jarring looking at social media and then seeing, you know, everybody in the same place and singing along. And it just, it's great. I'm so excited about uh, the world becoming more normal and seeing tours announced and, you know, our awesome independent music scene starting to, you know, come back to life. It's been obviously a difficult year, but being able to watch that, uh, you know, breathe some life into people's lungs is really, really exciting. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to, I actually have not figured out my first show as of yet, but uh, I know it will be one that's coming up in the next couple months, probably going to hit Furnace Fest. So if you are going to Furnace Fest, would love to say what's up. I know there's going to be probably a lot of you that are going to be there, but uh, yeah, looking forward to that. And uh, I think I'm going to have uh, Chad, the proprietor of Furnace Fest on a future episode of the podcast. So anyways, that's that. But uh, let's dive into Greg. Great conversation. We paint the town red. <laughs> we go through all of his musical projects. We go through uh, you know, so many different things in relation to his life, his musical output. And I'm very thankful for Greg for coming out and hanging on the show. So uh, yeah, let's listen to the little engine kid and then we will dive into the conversation with Greg.
I'm going to take you back to the uh, probably, probably 97 or so where uh, I first heard Engine Kid on the uh, in-flight compilation revelations, you know, m- much spoken about comp that, uh, you know, yeah. got around to a lot of kids. Um, and I heard Windshield and I was like, it was interesting because, you know, at that time I was coming into the idea of like transitioning between being like a hardcore and punk kid to being like, oh, I can listen to music besides that you know right <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're you're allowed right <laughs> it's totally okay, it's okay to do that man <laughs> totally totally and then uh you know hearing the engine kit stuff i was like i like this but i can't really place like where you guys sit in the context of not only all these other bands that are you know on the rev comp but then um you know in looking obviously all your musical output over the time I think that is probably a pretty fair description of almost all the music you've created where it's like, well, I kind of know where to place this, but I don't really at the same time. <laughs> so is there a, is there kind of a, for lack of a better term, like a comfort in the discomfort of people being like, I don't exactly know where to put the stuff that Greg does musically. Well, I, I kind of love hearing that actually. Um, I, you know, you're a lot of times with, you know, music you make, you're so far inside, inside of it. And you're in a bubble, you know, so you don't really know. It's like, it makes sense to you um, and it's familiar to you, but it's hard, you know, you, it's, it's easy to lose perspective of what it, what it is for other people, what their perception is. So when I hear things like that, that like it is people maybe don't know what to do with it or it doesn't really, um, it's unfamiliar to them and um, possibly something new that they haven't heard. I love, I love hearing that personally. Um, and that's a good, uh, I take that as a compliment, <laughs> you know? Um, sure. but, um, so I, you know, I don't, it's, it's hard to answer that question because I'm just making the music that comes from, from me and, and, and what I'm feeling and, and, and what I, you know, so, so the sounds that I'm hearing in my head, I'm trying to, um, get those out through the music I create. Uh, so, um, I mean, I, I I've always, and it's, it, I guess it's interesting to hear that too, because, uh, uh, my entire, um, life making music, I've always sort of felt that, uh, I'm more of a, I'm coming at, I'm, I'm approaching music and creating it from a fan's standpoint, like as a, somebody who's really enthusiastic and influenced and, um, inspired by other people's music rather than someone who is like you know, completely innovative and, uh, in what they do, uh, that's sort of always, always had a look at it. I mean, every band that I've sort of been in, uh, has really sort of followed, has kind of almost like a somewhat of a blueprint to follow. Uh, and like, you know, it was like, Hey, you know, my, my first band, like, okay, we really wanted to, we really wanted to be like, uh, you know, D. Kreutzen and, and DRI and COC, you know, we had these very specific influences and like all through my life, I've gone through different phases musically or different bands that I've been to. And, and most of those b- bands that I've made, uh, they've sort of, um, they've had, you know, a handful of bands that they've been really inspired by. Um, and that's what's, that's what was the, uh, sort of the, uh, the core or the, uh, of the, of the, of the, of the, of each band, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I think what ha- maybe what's happened, <laughs> what's happened is that my taste, uh, and interest got more and more, uh, 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 uh sort of out there and obscure. And so people hadn't heard those bands that we were basically emulating or ripping off, <laughs> you know? So, sure. so for them to hear that, that band, maybe say like engine kid was like, okay, well maybe people have never heard slint, you know, especially in that world of, um, uh, nineties, uh, hardcore or post hardcore and revelation records. A lot of those kids, you know, maybe weren't familiar with bands like slint and bitch magnet and codeine, which were the bands that we were, um, taking our influence from at the time. Right. Uh, right. If yeah. You, know you were, what, if you know what I mean, you know, no, um, I do. Uh, the idea of like, 
you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, like <laughs> all, all you're doing, especially, you know, in the, your younger musical projects is you're like, yeah, I want to rip off like these four bands. And like, even though these four bands may not be sonically similar, you're just like, I like all of these things and we'll try to put this riff salad together <laughs> or whatever. Riff, riff salad. It, it, that's, that's exactly what it is. It's a riff salad. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and then, you know, as you get, as you get older too, and, and, and hopefully, um, more, uh, uh, skilled, uh, I get, I don't know, that's not the right word, but, uh, with your instrument, um, it's becomes less about emulating, uh, or being inspired by specific other bands, but more like, uh, maybe more like genres, something more general, or or maybe even um, maybe not music at all. Maybe be inspired by something different that happened in your life, or uh, maybe be inspired by art or film or something like that. And and I feel like <clears throat> you know, as, as I'm turning into an old man here, like, and especially with the music that I'm creating with um, with Sun and writing, you know, th- th- it becomes less about ripping off the Melvins and Earth. And more about taking influence from like jazz and from or from from different um, artists or different or even different different things that have happened in your life. As you get older, you know, you have more experiences in your life and those could, you know, be influential and help, uh, you know, be part of your, uh, you know, bleed into your um, your your um, music that you create, you know, Mm -hmm. but um when you're young, it's just like, you know, Hey, it's like, you you see a band live or you hear a record that really just blows your head off. And, you know, you're kind of, my first instinct on that stuff for many years was just like, well, that's what I want to do with my, with music. I'm going to, you know, I, I like playing in bands. I've, I've, I've played in bands. So I'm going to create a band now that sounds like, you know, in the case of engine kid is like, I'm going to create a band that sounds like, uh, you know, I'm really influenced by Slint and Codeine and, and Bitch Magnet. And, you know, and then right after Goat Snake, or sorry, right after Engine Kid broke up, I started a band called Goat Snake. And, and that our influence was like, we were really super into Black Sabbath. And, and, and then kind of the second wave of, of, of like this sort of Black Sabbath sounding inspired bands like Cathedral and Trouble and, and um, The Obsessed and I Hate God and things like that. But it's still, you know, kind of following this sort of, you know, this sort of uh, formula of like uh, inspiration bordering on emulation at times. <laughs> and I think I, I think honestly, it's like the people that I've been able, been fortunate enough to play with and, 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 and create these bands with and, and creating the music have been all like really talented and, and amazing uh, musicians and the music that we've created together, although it maybe started off as, 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 as kind of, you know, uh, emulation, it ended up, we ended up, uh, basically honing it and, 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 uh, you know, sort of carving it into our, our own thing. And, mm-hmm. um, I think engine kid was sort of the first band that's of mine that I feel that really, really kind of was making something on that was actually our own. Um, the bands I'd had before that were very, not to discount those bands, but they were, you know, they were derivative. They, and I don't think, I think partly because they were, they were short lived. They didn't have a lot of time to develop into anything. And, and, um, engine kid, even though it was, it wasn't, the band wasn't around for, for really that long. It was only about four years, but, um, I think, you know, my musical taste and sort of, um, my ability too as a player and the other guys in the band, we were, um, and the amount of practice we put in and work we put in. That's why it like, to me near the end of that band, we were really turning into something that was like quite different than what we started. And I thought was having its own sort of, um, you know, uh, it was becoming something, something unique on, and that, that could stand on its own, especially like, you know, the, starting with kind of like the angel wings album, and then there was material that we, you know, the, the material we made after that, before we broke up, that was like, okay, well, this is, this isn't just a slint clone, you know, um, this right. is something that we've, we've, um, that, like, that, that, that's our own now, you know. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. You definitely hit a lot of threads I'll pull on a little bit later, but um, just kind of wanted to get some, you know, for lack of a better term, more, uh, you know, biographical information on you. I know that you were, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were born and raised in the Pacific Northwest, right? <clears throat> I was actually born in Dallas, Texas, but yeah, I, I moved to, I moved to uh, Seattle when I was um, two years old and okay. um, I, I, I grew up in Seattle. So I, I can, you know, uh, I spent from, you know, t- uh, you know, 1972 to 1996 um, in Seattle, Washington. So all the formative years and um, high school getting into music and then um, and then post sure. high school. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> you you don't call yourself a Texan because <laughs> you always no, go two no. years there. And, and it's funny. It's like now I've lived in Los Angeles, um, uh, Southern California. <clears throat> for almost as long so now you know and i consider i consider um los angeles to be my home now which is it which is really um really bizarre uh i never thought that would happen but um but it's yeah. just you know i ended up here and loved it but but yeah i mean seattle was really important to me for um uh and a huge part of my life um and i you know still have family there and stuff uh, sure really- sure and what was the uh, family structure like growing up? Like mom and dad in the house, brothers and sisters. My mom, um, uh, my mom, uh, my mom was married a few times, so I had mm-hmm. um, um, the you know sort of the father figure was unstable in my in my life. Um, mm-hmm. I had a little brother um, who. Um, it's funny when I was in like growing up, and in high school, we were not very close at all. Um, but then after high school, like starting around, you know, um, probably about 1990, like right, right before the engine kid, actually, we started becoming really, really close. Um, and, uh, and we remain close to these day to this day, but, um, but yeah, so I grew up with him and, and my mom basically, and they both still live up there in, um, in Seattle. <clears throat> got it. Got it. Um, and what kind of kid did you, uh, you know, sort of find yourself being like, you know, once you got to like, you know, junior high and high school where you started to develop more of an identity, um, as it were, were you, you know, like, were you always drawn to the arts? Were you kind of like a a sports dude? Were you outgoing? Where did you find yourself? Yeah. When I was really into basketball when I was a kid, um, probably up until I was about 12 or 13 when I got really into music. And when okay. I got in, once I got into music, I, everything fell to the way <laughs> all totally. I cared about. And, um, and I, I got, um, I first, you know, like my, like freshman year of high school, um, kind of, or like, uh, eighth grade, like near sometime in that, I got really into, uh, I kind of discovered underground heavy metal and mm-hmm. bands like Metallica and, um, Motorhead, and Venom and, and, uh, Slayer and things like that. And that was just kind of, that really sort of changed my life in a lot of ways. Cause it was like, you know, I, 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 I was, I was really into like, before that I was really into like, you know, <clears throat> Led Zeppelin, ACDC and the who, and, you know, classic rock and stuff like that. And, you know, most of the music that I was exposed to or, um, knew about was, um, you know, of the, from, from, it was rock, you know, it was commercial rock and roll. And when I heard Metallica ride the light, um, or kill them all record. It's like, wow. It just, it just really knocked me on my ass. I just didn't know it was, it was, it was just incredible. And I think at that time, it kind of in that time of my life and sort of that age, I was looking for something new, um, and sort of more, uh, raw and aggressive. And, and that was, that fit the bill perfectly. And so once I got into that, once I heard that, heard a few bands, um, that were doing that style. I just, I wanted to know everything about what that music and, and other bands that, that sounded like that. And, um, and then that led me into punk rock and hardcore because it just became this thing of like finding something that was, you know, finding uh, digging deeper, um, and finding something that was even more and more extreme, more faster, more heavier, you know, it's like, um, it's like this, you know, it's like this quest. <laughs> Just, oh, for sure. <laughs> well, especially, especially, especially speed too. I was like, man, cause you know, I remember like, I remember talking to somebody that was like, um, it was just like this punk kid at my school. And, and it was just like, 
you know, it's like, oh, you know, Metallica, it's like the fastest band in the world. And so he's like, he's like, nah, you need to hear this band, Dirty Rotten Imbeciles. And I'm like, huh? And I heard it and I was like, oh my God, there's like, there's a style, there's some music that's even faster uh, than Metallica. It's like, you know, and Slayer. It was like, so once I heard, you know, to me, it was like, I just wanted it to be the fat, you know, the faster, the better, the fastest, the better, you know? Yeah. <laughs> No, especially too, where it's like once your paradigm gets shifted, where you listen to, you know, something that just, like you said, completely flips your lid, <laughs> like, whoa, whoa, DRI is faster than Metallica? Or it's just like, yeah, wait, Discordance Axis? Like, how can you get faster than that? <laughs> you said you hear other things and it's like, yeah. oh, okay, yeah, I was wrong. So now I have to think about music in a different way. Yeah. And, and really sort of the whole, you know, sort of aesthetic and culture of, of hardcore uh, punk rock music really, um, I really loved it because, um, it was really inviting as far as being a part of something. And you were, you know, you weren't separate from the band that was playing on the stage and, and you could jump up on that stage and, and, you know, participate and, you know, grab the mic and sing along and then jump off. And, you know, and, um, I really, that really like, that really, uh, resonated with me at that time. Um, cause I was going, you know, I was going to like metal shows, even some of like kind of the more underground ones, but it was still like, you know, like these guys were rock stars on stage. They were like, there was a definite separation between audience and band. And then I went and saw by chance, um, I went and saw, well, I went and saw a metal show, another kind of more like metal show, um, with a real kind of theatrical band, this band called the wild dogs from, uh, they're from Portland and, and the bands that opened for them at particular night were, uh, hardcore punk bands. There's a band called malfunction and a band called, um, the accused. And I had never seen a circle pit, you know, I'd never seen a stage dive. Um, at that point, this is like, you know, this is early 1985. And, um, and I was just blown away. I couldn't believe it. You know, and the guys on stage looked exactly like me, you know, jeans, t-shirt and, you know, scruffy hair and whatever. And, and, uh, they were just going berserk. And, and, uh, there was, it was like, there was no sort of, uh, there's nothing pretentious about it. There's nothing, they weren't posing. They weren't making any tra traditional, you know, rock or metal poses. And they weren't like yelling at the crowd and trying to, you know, to, to, to get them to scream louder or anything. They were just like, they were just going a million miles an hour and just being themselves. And I thought that was just like, I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life. And from that moment on, that's what I wanted to do. I was like, this is what I, this is where I want to be. This is, this is the scene that I, I want to be a part of. And, you know, I made, <laughs> then you get into like, you know, making your own fanzines and putting on your own shows and that whole thing. I was like, wow, this is, you really can be a part of this. Um, and there's a community there that was really um, accepting um, and, um, you know, and then there's like, you know, the, the, the real idealistic, um, you know, uh, political and, and social, uh, ideology of that whole scene too. And about, you know, being able to change the world and you're like, yeah, you know, we could do it. We could stop nuclear war and all this stuff. You know, you get really into that and like, you feel like you're, you're doing something with your time that is, is meaningful. Um, uh, and, um, I just, I, I, I bought into the whole thing, you know, uh, completely and, and loved it. Band merch is important to me. It's important to you. It's important to everybody in this independent music community. And you need to go to rockabilia.com to buy all of the band merch. Just go ahead and do that and use this code 100 words. That's the number 100 words, W O R D S. And that would get you 10% off of your order. Rockabilia.com is just a, a great great service provider for band merch it's all officially licensed so everybody gets paid all above the board stuff none of this horrific bootleg game that exists on the uh the instagrams and the social medias and the interwebs this is all great high quality stuff independently run business been doing this been in the cotton slinging biz for over 30 years and it ships from the midwest so it gets to you very very quickly there's no reason that you can't have fun on their website and buy a few things for yourself. Maybe buy a few things for your friends and family. Whatever it is, use this code. 100 words, 10% off. Band merch is important. It's the life's blood of this scene. Touring and band merch. That's it. What else is there? You know, streaming royalties? 
maybe question mark, but for real, do this and it will benefit you. It'll benefit the show. It'll benefit the bands. Everybody wins in this scenario. Rockabilia.com. 100 words is the promo code. Let me solve all of your holiday shopping problems right now by talking to you about the premium audio products from Raycon. They have wireless earbuds, headphones, and speakers that offer premium sound. I personally adore the wireless earbuds. I've been using them for four or five years. They got a ton of battery life. We're talking 54 plus hours. It's incredible. And honestly, I have gotten them for gifts for my significant other. I've gotten them for my family and friends. And they all come back to me and they're like, dude, this is incredible. Why have I never used these before? And I'm like, I don't know. That's your fault. That's why I am here to help you. And for the next month, Raycon will have a countdown to Christmas with a new pop-up flash deal for you to take advantage of every single day. Now, what can you do? You can go to buyraycon.com slash Ray and get the best deals around. That gets you 15% off site-wide with code HOLIDAY plus free shipping. That is code HOLIDAY at buyraycon.com slash Ray for 15% off your Raycon purchase and then free shipping. So again, go to buyraycon.com slash Ray, solve all of your shopping problems, and then maybe, you know, toss a pair of headphones here for you, okay? Maybe just an idea, but... Thank you, Raycon, and buy them now. Well, I think it's. Re- I, I appreciate you articulating that because I do think it's when you feel like you can be an active participant at an early age in your life, where you feel like you know, in every other aspect, you have no sort of you know authority, right. and then all of a sudden you have the idea to you know, like you said, create fanzines, playing bands. You're just like, dude, I can do all this stuff without asking permission. Like this is unbelievable, and it's yeah. so. To, you know, you didn't say the words, but it is empowering. And I, you know, most of us that are connected to the, you know, punk and hardcore and metal, anything independent, like that is what attracts everybody. Like, yes, of course, music and like, that's cool. But then when you get obsessed with it and you take those next steps, that's what, you know, makes you a lifer. <laughs> yeah. And you're so right. Cause that time in your life too, you know, you're dealing with parents or you're dealing with, you know, teachers at school or other uh, authority figures and you're, re- you know, kind of your first sort of time in your life that you're butting up against that and rebelling of course against it and then here comes this scene that is like you know basically um is a a safe haven and supports your ideals and 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 is empowering it it all makes sense you know um and a lot you know some people reach that you know that for them it's their their outlet for that is sports you know for example um but uh yeah for me it was the it was it was the hardcore scene and community and and I just, you know, just the fact that, you know, I was like, man, I could just pick up a guitar and teach myself to do it and then form my own band, you know, it's like, and which is what I did, you know, and, and it was like, I, I thought that was amazing. And it was, um, you know, at that time in my life and who I was and what my situation was, it was, it was perfect. And, um, mm-hmm. it was just, you know, to me that that's the real catalyst and, uh, you know, it was a real important time in my life because that really formed who I am today and, and, and continues to be important in as far as running this, you know, um, and operating the Southern Lord label, you know, it's like, it's a lot of those, a lot of those ideals, um, and values that, uh, that I have today are from being involved in the punk and hardcore scene when I was 15 years old, you know? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, and I, I know obviously the connection with, you know, with brotherhood, I know you played in a band, uh, you know, before that, That's but right. you know, brotherhood, you know, was ostensibly kind of your, your first real, you know, <laughs> out there band as far as like touring and putting out records and stuff like that. Um, it, it seems like, you know, in, in that particular area, it was, uh, and still to this day, like the Pacific Northwest, like, yes, there's been a lot of great music that has come out there and, you know, from all different shapes and sizes, but it's always been, you know, kind of like this corner of the country. That's like, it takes a lot of effort to get up there to tour. You know, (laughs) we got to do a lot to get up there. That's right. Uh, Did you feel like, you know, as brotherhood started playing out and you started to see the scene kind of pop up around it from all the, you know, straight edge hardcore kids. And then, you know, uh, it started to spread out. Did you feel like, or did you recognize that there was something kind of like building there or did it feel just kind of like, well, it's just us and our friends doing our thing. Yeah, it was a, it, it was kind of just us and our friends and our thing. I mean, it was a really weird time in Seattle because um, there was this, the, um, what happened was, is that uh, the city passed an ordinance called the Teen Dance Hall Ordinance, 
there's basically a couple shows that happened in like 1986 or so. One of them I was actually the promoter of. It was a circle jerk show that I was the promoter of that there was a riot. Uh, it was There happened to be snowing around that time. And um, we had found this, you know, basically there was a building that um, was, was, you know, had we just basically this guy, uh, this local promoter um, who had money, his name was Tony Chu. He was like this, um, this Chinese, I think he had some, I think he owned some Chinese restaurants or something. He's a Chinese guy. And he was, um, and he had run this place called the rock theater, uh, also called the, also known as the gorilla gardens in Seattle. It's an amazing venue where I first saw my first shows. And I mean, it was incredible. Every single band, um, a lot of bands played there back in, uh, in, in the, in about 1984, 1985. And it got closed down and I don't know if he lost his lease or what the deal was, but so he opened up a new spot and he didn't have all his permits together. And it was really like, you know, by the seat of his pants type of thing. And we had the circle jerks booked to play a show. And, and, you know, the circle jerks back then were very, it was a big deal. And they had some history with Seattle where they had had a hard time playing up there. So they hadn't played for a long time. Everyone was expecting it. So of course, you know, uh, the place holds about 150 people and, you know, 600 punks show up and it's snowing outside and the place is not, it's the place is really like still sort of this, you know, gutted out warehouse that we just basically threw together to have the show. And there's a huge riot and the police came and, um, you know, punks were throwing snowballs at cops and it was, it was, <laughs> it was insane, man. And I got arrested. I was 15 years old. And, um, I got arrested, um, Tony, he like slipped out the back or something like that. And, um, the cops were like, who's in charge here? And I like, look around and I was like, uh, me, <laughs> it's really stupid. And, uh, they put the, put the cuffs on me and put me in a paddy wagon with all these other punk rockers who had been arrested for, uh, throwing snowballs at cops. It was just, it was insane. But at the time it was a huge deal in Seattle and it basically because of that show and there was a, there was another, another incident too. They passed a law in Seattle, the city of Seattle passed a law called the teen dance hall ordinance, which basically made it illegal for all ages shows to happen in Seattle. You had, they made it so that you, if you were going to put on a show, you had to have a legit venue space that had like, you know, a million dollar insurance policy uh, in order to, um, to put on shows and no one had that, you know? So all ages shows in Seattle and, and really in turn, hardcore, uh, just got wiped out and there was, there was no, there was no bands and there was no shows and it became impossible, um, for people to see, you know, punk and hardcore kids to see shows, um, cause there wasn't any, and, you know, Seattle, as you mentioned, was already sort of geographically isolated where, you know, bands, it was, a, it was, there was a lot, there, there wasn't a lot of bands that would be, were able to tour and get up to Seattle. You know, they, they could go to Portland, um, maybe, and, and Portland had a really great scene and they had great clubs there that were consistent, but Seattle was always inconsistent and it was kind of a pain in the ass to get to. So a lot of bands just skip it. So there wasn't a lot of outside, you know, touring or influence coming into Seattle. And that's really, you know, one of the main, the, the main sort of uh, reasons that um, the Seattle music and, you know, for lack of a better word, grunge happened was because bands were isolated from other bands and, you know, musicians and, and kids and punks or whatever were, were isolated from other stuff. So we just made our own music you know? Right. And, um, and it kind of, you know, it really had its own flavor because of that, because of there wasn't as much outside influences or these, you know, bands coming through town and, and, um, you were, you were all influencing each other in, because you didn't have a lot of this external, you know, uh, well, not even noise, but this external influence. So that totally makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And it's funny. A lot of people don't know that about, you know, grunge bands or whatever the popular bands that came, but that's what it was. I mean, at one point it just became a bummer because I loved, you know, <clears throat> beyond punk and hardcore, you know, there's bands like the Melvins, for example, that was my favorite band actually. Um, mm -hmm. They were my favorite local band and, you know, they weren't necessarily punk or hardcore. They were doing something different, but 
I couldn't go see them anymore. And um, another band, Green River, who I really liked, um, especially their early stuff. And, you know, there were some really cool bands. It was like, well, it's just cool to see live music really loud, you know, and oftentimes heavy live, live music to me was great. It didn't have to, didn't, you know, um, it, even if it wasn't punk uh, or hardcore following those kind of those sort of rules. But so I, you know, we were kind of shut off from live music at all, which was just uh, to me, unless you wanted to go to the Seattle Center Arena and see, you know, uh, ACDC or something like that. You know, there's the only big shows where were the, the, really the only place that, you, that s- someone under 21 could go see live music. And my age at that time that this happened was, you know, I was 17, 18 years old when the, when they, um, when they shut down all ages shows. So, um, bands like, you know, Nirvana and Soundgarden and, um, the Melvins, those guys were a little older than us. So they, they could go to those shows and they, you know, they could play them because they were, they were four or five years older than, than I was, but my age group, you know, being 17 or 18 in, um, 87 and 88 in Seattle, um, you just couldn't, you couldn't, um, there was nothing. So brotherhood kind of existed in this, you know, vacuum, you know, we, we, um, I was, I still wanted to play music and, you know, I, we, I started this band and I was really, um, uh, I really wanted to do something along the lines of what was happening in New York, uh, at that time period, bands like, uh, you know, youth of today, um, underdog, um, uh, uh, crippled youth, you know, I was really, I was kind of inspired by what was happening in New York at that time in the early revelation records bands and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and also really into the bands that I kind of missed out on from the East coast, like, uh, SSD control and, and DYS, um, those bands that were also, you know, straight edge band, minor threat. (laughs) Um, you know, I missed out on those. It was a little bit before my time, but we were, that's those, I wanted to, you know, take those, the influences from, I wanted to sound like something like that, but with this really sort of, you know, uh, the sort of the, the more sort of intensity of what youth of today was doing, um, and the whole youth crew movement at that time, but mm-hmm. there was no one in Seattle right. that was into that. So it was like literally the guys in the band that were the only ones that were really into this stuff. So we really, and you know, the shows that we played that, you know, the, the like, which were like, you know, basement shows, you know, you could kind of get away with that until the cops came type of thing or, um, but we really didn't do much. Um, uh, it was just, there was nothing there, you know, and, but we just did it anyways. And, and then eventually things started opening up. Um, they, we kind of got around, um, the rules a bit by having shows in, um, in a nearby, uh, city called Tacoma, Washington, where, they didn't have to follow the rules of Seattle. So there was some venues that, that formed up there and there were some really cool shows that happened and, and brotherhood would play some of those. And then I don't know if what the deal was, if they had the money for the insurance policy or not, but then there was a place down in Seattle uh, called the okay hotel that um, was a cafe and um, also a venue. And then they started having all ages shows. Uh, and they, and that was like the only place in the city of Seattle where you could do it, but they were having, I mean, they had a, you know, everyone played there. Um, and, you know, including, you know, some of the, uh, you know, like Nirvana and, and Tad and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we kind of, there was just, wasn't a hardcore scene in Seattle. And then I, I think kind of near the end, brotherhood was, Brotherhood was such a short lived band. I mean, we were only around for like a year and a half, something right. like that. Um, but kind of the aftermath of Brotherhood, there was a lot of, there's a bunch of kids that got kind of picked up on what we were doing and like, like, this, like this group of kids, um, Undertow. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. I mean, it's like Undertow and Strain and all that stuff started to come yeah, out. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. That, I mean, but, but Brotherhood had broken up at that point, you know? I mean, sure. th- there, Undertow had a band before called Refuse. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and they were like, it, you know, it's hilarious because, um, uh, Undertow will refuse. Um, the guitar player, Mark, um, his sister was my first girlfriend in high school. And so I turned him on. He was like this goth kid into like the cure and, and, um, 
and uh, you know, things like that. And, and he, uh, <laughs> Depeche Mode and stuff. And, uh, and I played him like, uh, you know, first I played him like DRI and then I played him like youth of today. And, and he, and he just flipped out and he turned into a, like got into hardcore and yeah. he basically picked up the guitar and, and, um, and he got turned on these other kids in our, in our neighborhood. We all lived in the North end of Seattle, like Lake forest park shoreline. These are the, it's where we lived. And, um, and so there was, you know, basically there was the only people that were into, into kind of real, real hardcore or straight edge, uh, were, were the guys in the band brotherhood and these kids in, in refuse who later became undertow. <laughs> but the connection is crazy because my first girlfriend ever was, uh, was, was Mark, uh, Holcomb's sister. And then through those guys, they introduced me to their buddy that they ran around with, which was Stephen O'Malley, who I <laughs> later ended up doing <laughs> all the, you know, a lot of stuff in life with including son. So, um, it's all kind yeah. of intertwined there. Yeah, no, that that's beautiful. And <laughs> like, I, uh, you know, that notion of generations, you know, getting influenced by one another. It's just like, it, it's really cool when that happens, because then you, you know, are able to look back on it. And actually, that dovetails nicely into a question I was going to ask where the, it seems like, you know, hardcore and punk in general can be looked at as some looked at as something kind of inconsequential, because like, you know, when people grow up, and they're just like, Oh, yeah, I listened to that stuff when I was a kid. But like, you know, I don't like to I don't like it anymore. I don't listen to it, which I understand they're not listening to it. But like looking at it, you know, and kind of in a judgmental factor. Um, you know, do you do you see people kind of like, not calling certain people out, but do you see that kind of thought process where it's like, Oh, yeah, that's something I was into as a kid. But like, it doesn't mean anything to me anymore. Whereas like, you know, I know people like yourself have not expressed that thought because it's like, well, this has all led me to where I'm at right now. Yeah. It's such a, it, it is my life really actually. It, 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 that is my life. Yeah, sure. I mean, people, different people get into different things and, um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, it's interesting with hardcore because um, there's so much, I think there's a lot more emotion um, built into it. And um, I think there's a lot more, um, participation as well. So I, I, I know, I feel like when a person changes and they get out of it, I know there's a lot of, um, that can be really hard for people around them to deal with. I mean, there's so many bands that <laughs> are just basically formed and all the lyrics are about that, you know, like chain of strength or something. It's like, you know, <laughs> yep. you know, you're not, you're not who you used to be. And you said you always would. What happened? You know, it's like, it's like, right. Uh, and, and I can understand that sentiment for sure, but you know, people change and they get into different things and, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I just think it maybe seems odd to people because of this emotional investment and participation that we all have in this or, or have had in this community. You know what I mean? Um, something it becomes more, uh, you know, you're more invested. And so that, that can, I don't know, it can be harder for people to accept when people change and, um, you know, don't, that don't, uh, it doesn't, uh, don't regard they it. They don't stick with it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. And I always found it funny. This is just like a random observation, but I always found it interesting when, I mean, when I b became aware of brotherhood, I was always found it funny where it's like, okay, you know, you guys hooked up with crucial response, which obviously was a label in Europe. And like, you know, clearly like the most tried and true, tr you know, straight edge label <laughs> that you possibly could have worked with. And then it's funny because then you end up obviously putting out a record with revelation and engine kid where it was like, oh yeah, brotherhood would have made a lot of sense on rev, but like it <laughs> just didn't work out at that time. Well, yeah. And, and in fact, that whole crucial response thing, you know, after Brotherhood broke up was basically what happened with Brotherhood was like, it was really interesting. What, what happened was um, in 1989, the beginning or like probably like March of 1989, um, we got asked to go on tour, a U.S. tour with the with a band called the a local band called The Accused, who um, was one of the first bands I ever heard and really kind of turned me on to hardcore and punk rock and, and underground metal. And the guitar player, Tommy Niemeyer was kind of took me under his wing. He met me at, I met him at a show. I went up to him and started talking to him, told him how much I liked his band and, you know, bought a tape from him or something. And, and, um, and then he, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd go to all their shows and he sort of, he started making, you know, mixtapes for me. And, and, um, and we started, we became friends. And so, you know, a couple years later, after I've, form brotherhood and stuff the accused a very different ideology from brotherhood you know uh they're really into uh 
you know, uh, drugs and alcohol and horror movies and things like that. You know, Brotherhood's obviously a straight edge band. But I got a call one day from Tommy and he's like, hey, man, um, you know, this band you have Brotherhood. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, would you guys like to go on tour with the accused? <laughs> I'm like, what? You know, that doesn't make sense. Really an odd, odd pairing. But he explained to me that their booking agent uh, was this New York guy, Johnny Stiff. And he, um, he was like, look, you know, I got, I got, um, I I'm, I'm going to book a tour for you guys, but I'm going to, uh, I would like you guys to go out on tour with the straight edge band. And they laughed at him like, why? He's like, well, because straight edge is really popular right now. And I think we'll be able to get a lot more kids at the show. And the accused were like, you know, they're laughing, but then Tommy goes, Hey man, I know a straight edge band, like, you know, Greg Anderson, he's got a straight edge band. And they're like, (laughs) perfect. (laughs) Dude, I, I love I love that it was like at that time it was a, a marketing strategy. Like, that's so good, which is which is really ridiculous if you think about it and analyze that. I mean, it's I, I, it doesn't really be, it makes no sense, especially the accused who were actually you know they were pretty popular at that time. They were on Combat Records. They had just finished a really successful uh, U.S. tour of GBH, and you know I mean they were they were kind of at their peak. Um, and, and really popular as far as, if, as far as uh, my perception was. So I was like, wow, why do you need another band on, uh, on you know, <laughs> right. Twitch? especially like, you know, those guys were very, you know, I mean, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't like poison idea assholes about being into drugs and stuff like that, but they were, you know, they had their thing and, and we were the opposite, but, um, our singer was also friends with them. And like I said, you know, I had a, a, a friendship with Tommy Niemeyer. So, so that's what we did. So we went on a U.S. tour uh, with those guys that was just, it was incredible. And it was, you know what, in the end, Johnny Stiff, the promoter was right because all these, all these like young, hardcore straight edge kids came out to see brotherhood because at that time, straight edge bands didn't tour, you know, you didn't, it was, sure. just, it was really localized. And unless you were living in New York city or Boston, you didn't see any of those bands. So when, when you're playing in like Salt Lake city or you're playing in, um, you know, Oklahoma, uh, all of a sudden, you know, anyone who's interested in minor threat you know, or whatever, it's like, Oh my God, there's a band that's like this, that is coming to my town. I'm going right. to that. So we had a lot of people coming up the show and it ended up being really successful and I remember the accused guys were just totally blown away and they ended up like, you know, they ended up like giving us extra money because the, the tour was going so well. It was just like, it was really awesome. It was an incredible experience, but you know, um, it was my first time ever being on tour and actually everyone in our band, all four of us, it was, it was our first time being on tour. And at the end of the tour, we all hated each other. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's like, right. oh, you know, you, you really get to know somebody when you're stuck in a van with them. And, um, and that was the first time any of us had ever done that. So we were really inexperienced and green and didn't know how to deal with, you know, deal with anything and um, deal with the emotions and dealing with other people's eclectic personalities. So we basically came home and I said, you know, fuck this. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm, I'm moving to San Diego. And uh, I was out of, you know, cause I was out of high school and um, I wasn't going to college and um, uh, I was trying to, you know, either get an apartment in Seattle or, you know, I don't know. I made a decision to go down to San Diego and play some music with some friends I'd made down there. And um, so we broke up. And so that the whole, you know, sorry for the long windedness on this, but what happened was um, Ron, the singer, uh, he made a deal with a German label that I had no, I didn't have any, I didn't have any clue about any, what anything that happened after that band um, after we came back from that tour. And he basically did that whole deal without, really letting anyone know about it. So, uh, it was like, Oh, okay, well that's, this is a, but I was so, I had already moved on, you know, I was always, I was actually, I was really, um, I was really sort of trying to leave a lot of that, um, music, um, behind me. Um, I was really getting into like, um, stuff that was happening in, in, in Washington, DC and revolution summer and like, you know, rights of spring and embrace and gray matter and, and, and bands like that. And my musical chase taste was changing. And, um, because of that, I was like that, you know, I would just put it all behind me and I didn't care about it. So when the record came out, I was just like, it was just so, so over, you know, for me, um, which was, you know, uh, uh, strange, but, uh, it took a really long time for me to kind of, you know, I don't know, to 
come to terms with uh, what that band was and and what we did and and then really then it really kind of a switch went off and I really was like man this is really it was a really important and fun time in my life and sure. and really it was because the singer and I um we became really really close um after the band broke up and we were kind of close during the band and before the band we were actually closer but then we got in the band together we sort of grew apart a little bit and then, you know, like I said, of course we broke up, but then after the band broke up and a few years later, we ended up becoming really close friends and hung out all the time. And, um, and, and then we, we remained friends for, uh, uh, we, we, we remained friends for a really long time until he passed away, um, a couple years ago, but before he passed away, uh, and you know, we were, uh, like I said, we were very close. Um, we, we got to put that record out, reissue it properly with um with a nice uh booklet and liner notes from the bass player um and uh you know it was it was kind of kind of document it properly because i considered honestly i considered that crucial response release to be somewhat of a you know kind of a bootleg or just like you know, right <laughs> it's totally. just like it was kind of ron's deal and and, and you know ron who I, I i love to death and uh and and you know um he was just kind of like, Oh, that's Ron's thing. I'll just let him do his thing. But, but it was nice to, it was, uh, you know, the point being, it was nice to really kind of document that properly. And, um, you right, know, the full, the full circle moment of just like, Oh, this is coming back to like where we all feel proud of releasing this and to put our stamp on it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it was a kind of a thing too, like celebrating Ron and I's friendship and, you know, the bass player <laughs> I, I'm still, <clears throat> still friendly with as well. And, and he has an interesting story. He's the, uh, the bass player for that band. Um, he, uh, I did a band with him right after brotherhood. That was like I said, kind of more DC influenced called galleons lap. And then he, um, when I formed engine kid, he formed a band. Um, he formed Sunny Day real estate. And then he became the bass player for the Foo fighters and still the bass player for the Foo fighters. So, yep, um, yep. it's, uh, but it's cool. And, and we're still friends as well. And, and it, it was funny when I was talking to him about the reissue and, he was really excited about it. And he's like, he wanted to write the liner notes. And I was like, Oh, this is so cool. You know, this would be great to have his perspective too, because he was, he was kind of the odd man out in that band because he, he was, he wasn't straight edge and, but he was such a great bass player and such, and he was a really close friend of ours. And we were like, man, it'd be awesome to be in a band with Nate. And we were like, but he's not straight edge. And we're right. like, ah, who cares? <laughs> you know, like, let's just say, it's like, it didn't matter. Cause, and it was funny. I remember like when I invited him to come down and, and, um, and, uh, jam and, and, uh, see if he wanted to be in the band. He's like, he's like, man, I, I love, I love your music, man. And, 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 and I love hanging out with you. He's like, but I'm not straight edge. And I'm like, yeah, I know it's okay. It was, you know, just it was, we just was, hopefully people won't find out. You know? yeah, just put up, put on a varsity jacket, you'll be fine. Dude. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so then to have him do the liner notes too, and like have his perception, and especially like who he is now and what he's done with his life musically, it's like wow, this is amazing to have him like you know sort of pen his thoughts and perspective of of his, what he was doing and what brotherhood was in you know, so many years ago, um, it was great. So that, that was a project to me that was like, I, I really enjoyed. Of course. Uh, yeah. Something yeah. to be proud of. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, it's Ray, the host of this very podcast. And let me ask you a question. What if you had insights into your genetics that could help empower you to live healthier? How would you use that knowledge? You can hear me talk about insights from my DNA that have affected my personal health journey on this season of the podcast Spit from iHeartRadio and 23andMe. Host Baratune Day Thurston, which by the way, incredible dude, has a podcast called How to Citizen. I can't highly recommend that any more than I am right now, but listen to that and listen to this podcast. But he explores how more and more people are finding out that DNA is about more than just ancestry. It's a key to understanding your health. Your genetic profile can tell you if you are at an increased likelihood for developing a particular condition. It's knowledge that can help you make smarter choices about your health and your lifestyle. On this season of Spit, 
You'll hear me and 22 other podcasters and influencers discuss what genetics revealed about our health and how that knowledge can impact the way we live our lives. Listen to my episode out now on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. What's the worst thing about sports? (laughs) That's right. All those breaks in play. But you can make them all better by using Grubhub. You wouldn't have a movie night without snacks, so why would you settle for a halftime without food? Grubhub has every food you could possibly crave, from national favorites to local spots. Reorder your regulars or find something brand lip-smackingly new. You can search by city, cuisine, restaurant name, or if it's a firm favorite, even by menu item. Delivered on time at the lowest price. Order through the Grubhub app or online at grubhub.com. That's grubhub.com. And of course, don't forget, with the holidays right around the corner, Grubhub gift cards are the perfect gift for everyone on your list. Now Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free. That's $0 food delivery fees from your favorite restaurants. Visit goforgrubhub.com slash Amazon for terms and details. Go for Grubhub. Yeah. Um. The uh, I find it interesting with like, you know, I mean, Engine Kid and Goat Snake, you know, ostensibly just from as far as like all of your musical projects were concerned, um, were, you know, kind of the most, for lack of a better term, commercial, you know, where it's like there <laughs> they're, they're, they're can, can be people that can, you know, obviously follow the fact that like, oh, there is a song and there are <laughs> verses and choruses and stuff like that. Um, was there ever any notion? Uh, I mean, I know that you put, you know, a lot of time and b- both those bands, as you mentioned, were very prolific. Uh, was there ever, uh, I guess, a consideration of doing it, quote unquote, like, you know, for real, where it's like, okay, here we go. We got management, booking agent, all that sort of stuff. Um, I know Engine Kid obviously, you know, dabbled with that. But, um, you know, was there any, I guess, aspirations behind either of those projects? Not really. I mean, especially actually especially not engine kid i mean we you know we were sort of around in a time when that was really that was ha- it was happening you know like we yep. sunny day real estate got their got their deal with sub pop but i mean we were on we were on a, a local label too that was you know not not even near what sub pop was but still a reputable label called cz records yeah and um but sub pop was you know they were the kingpins so um but yeah there was of course bands that we knew and playing with uh, that were getting these major label deals and that was when all that stuff was being handed out very freely uh, or more freely. Um, but we didn't want to create music to get, you know, to get to that point or to be one of those bands. We still, you know, to me, it was always really important to be true to what you're doing and, you know, uh, create the music that you wanted to make, not that somebody else wanted you to make, you know, and, um, and that was kind of the, you know, that was sort of the thing about Engine Kid is, especially in that time in Seattle is like, there was a lot, there was a very specific sound that was happening in the Pacific Northwest at that time period. And I felt like we were really sort of the end, we were doing something very different than that. You know, you know we, we, <laughs> we, you know, we weren't influenced by Stooges uh, and, uh, you know, uh you know, Aerosmith and, and, Sa- and Sabbath so much as, you know, more like Slint, Bitch Magnet and Codeine, you know what I mean? Like we weren't, sure. we weren't, um, following the, we weren't, we didn't sound like that and we didn't want to sound like that. And that's not what we were into. But, um, and then Sunny Day, you know, honestly, to me, it's like, uh, I wasn't really a fan of that band and that their music was a little bit kind of, uh, too melodic to, for me. Um, the direction they were going was way more melodic. I was more interested in, um, uh, in heavy, you know, and, and playing heavy and, and, um, and more aggressive and, uh, um, and really sort of, and then for us too, like, you know, of course the huge part of the, of engine kid was the dynamics and playing really soft and really quiet. And then, and then, and then playing extremely, uh, heavy and, and loud and bombastic. That was kind of what we were more about. And, um, so I kind of felt like we were just sort of on our, on our own, you know, and, and, um, but, but there was crazy things happening then, you know, people that, that there was, there was, you know, there was publishing companies and, and major labels and coming in and just throwing money around and just like, just throwing a, a, a you know, just throwing anything up at the wall and hoping it'll stick. And, you know, uh, 
I, we definitely, there was definitely talk amongst engine kid at that time. Like, Oh, you know, maybe we're going to be one of those bands, but we're not going to, you know, at that time, our, our whole thing was like, well, we're not, we're not going to change or write music to, to be that band. You know, if it happens, it happens. That would be great. Uh, or right. it would be great. We didn't even know. I mean, no one really knew what was going on back then and had any knowledge about business or anything. So, uh, and a lot of bands got screwed and it ruined a lot of bands. There's bands that we knew that, you know, were in their formative and, uh, time frame of their band and, and, and then got a major label deal and they didn't even release their first album, you know? Um, yeah. so I guess, you know, so we were, maybe we were fortunate. I don't know, but we, what, whatever the case is, it, that wasn't a concern for us. We were just making, yeah, that wasn't the pursuit. Sure. Yeah, we were making yeah. music we loved, and um, uh, and that was that, you know. Yeah, With, uh, a question about Sun, where you know I, I found it uh, really, really interesting. You know, as you and Steven started to you know explore all of the musical textures that you guys have you know gone across and all of your releases it, in the early two thousands, it was really interesting to watch. Um, you know, uh, there was a lot of attention paid to you guys, you know, especially from the sort of, you know, critical acclaim and, you know, people paying attention to what you guys were doing, not only from that perspective, but then, you know, attending live shows and like, you know, playing festivals that, you know, you guys, uh, you, you, just in my own personal opinion, like people would never have imagined you guys playing, you know, it's like, hey, we'll play Pitchfork. It's like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> we don't sound like any of these bands on here. Um, was it interesting for you guys to kind of like, track this stuff as it was coming to you where it's like, wow, I like, uh, this is so, so bizarre that, you know, these really long, intricate, you know, patience building songs uh, will be played out in, uh, you know, a festival during the daytime or whatever, or what did you guys just kind of take it in stride because people were paying attention to it? Yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, I still to this day am, am, am blown away that um, the music that we create and the sounds we create with that, with sun um, have, have connected or people have resonated with people and, and people connect to what we're doing. I, 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 cause it's very challenging and unorthodox music. So yeah, I mean, anything, you know, any of those sort of like, you know, uh, higher profile festivals or that attention that we've gotten or, or, you know, really sort of interesting eclectic people like Julian Cope or David Byrne, you know, when, when they've shown interest and, and been supportive of the band, it's, it's, it, it's just, it blows me away. <laughs> it really does because of the, what Steven and I have done from the very beginning was just make music for ourselves that we wanted to, that we wanted to, that we wanted to make, you know, that we, that, that, um, and it was really sort of this selfish pursuit in, in, uh, in, uh, that we that we started it was like oh this is just an excuse for him and I to get in a room with as many amplifiers as we can um, string together and um, and play heavy riffs and you know obviously it's evolved or devolved depending on how you look on it uh, sure. into other things over the years and it's 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 grown into this of course its own you know, beast, uh, but, um, and it's different, but, um, than, than when we first started, but there's still, there's still so many of the, the sort of the, um, aesthetic, uh, and approach and ideology of those early days that it's, it's still important to what we're doing now. Um, but, and, and with that, it's just like, I'm still, I'm still shocked that people, um, have, connected with this music so um so strongly um and it's so it's it's really um and, and it's really it's it's really a, it's a trip because you know all my life i've played in bands that had kind of this formula of doing things and it's like you know the reason that you're you're doing making this music is because you you're you're wanting to play it in front of an audience you're wanting to put it out on a um on an album uh you know on cd or vinyl or whatever uh, and you're, you're hoping that people like it, you know, that's kind of why you're, do, you know, that's sort of why you're doing it in a way like you, you're hoping that, um, people will, will get into it, you know, and you play a show and, and you're hoping that the audience reacts positively to what you're doing, you know, um, that's what your kind of goal is for doing it. I mean, um, and with son, we threw all that out the window. And it was like, we don't care about anything except for playing in a room together. And, sure. um, you know, when we made the decision to, 
play it live. It was like, we, we didn't care uh, whether people liked it or not. And it was like, we weren't, um, we weren't concerned about that. We weren't concerned about putting out a record. We weren't concerned about, we weren't concerned about the reaction uh, of the, uh, of the listener or the audience. And it's, what's interesting is that's kind of, that has become the most, um, successful, I guess, of the user, uh, group that I've been involved in. It's really strange. And, um, you know, with all that said, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, um, that we have no regard for our audience. I, I, without, without the people that have gotten in, without the people that are in, uh, getting into the band, we wouldn't have the resources to be able to continue to do what we do. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm like, I, I'm extremely grateful that people uh, are into our music. It's just that we never created the music in order to, um, with that being the goal in mind, you know what I mean? So, um, but I don't, but I don't value it any less. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I, I'm, 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 <laughs> I, 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 when somebody comes up to me after the show or comes up to me, whatever, and, and tells me that they're into what we're doing, it, it's, it still blows my mind. And I'm super grateful for that. Um, it's just weird. Right. It's just, you know, for the first time in my life ever, I was the, the band that I was in or the group that I was in, that wasn't something we thought of, you know, it's like, Oh, cause, cause we, cause you know why we didn't think of it is because we thought that no, one, we thought everyone would hate it. We're right. like, no one's going to be into this shit, man. You know, this is like, this is just, us like getting high off our own farts, you know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, do you know what we just put you through? We put you through one song in 35 minutes. You understand that, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, but you know, now it's like growing into this developed into this thing. That's just like, it's really important for a lot of people. And a lot of people have had these, you know, these, connections and reactions to it that are just uh, extremely moving. And it's been really, you know, that has become inspiring for, for me. And I, and I, I believe I speak for Steven on that too. And then to keep going and really sort of keep pushing it. It's like, okay, yeah, this, this is, this, this is cool. Like us pushing this as far as we possibly can, like that, that this is, um, this is all having, a uh, a, a positive effect on not only the people that are listening to it, but on us. So let's keep, let's keep doing that. And that was, you know, honestly, that was kind of, you know, somewhat loosely what our last album life metal was all about. Like, so (laughs) celebrating life and celebrating something, um, celebrating light, you know, and, and, you know, because the sun is always kind of, sun is sort of can be pigeonholed and has reputation for being this dark, ominous, evil, uh, mm-hmm. sounding group and with life metal it's like well we wanted to kind of we wanted to um sort of present a different uh take on 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 what on 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 sound and music and that we created and there's a lot there's a you know and through a lot of people are like ah oh, it just sounds like sun it's great it's heavy and you know, ominous and whatever, but to us, it was like, you know, the sort of the songwriting um, and the creation process of the, of the pieces of music that are on there and in, um, and the artwork as well. And the whole presentation was more about um, embracing the light and embracing life and celebrating life. And the fact that we've all, we've all are, are, are still, you know, that we've survived. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of my take on it. And um and, and that's kind of, you know, that's where the band is at sort of, uh, right now in our, uh, mentally, you know, um, and, and it's really interesting now with all, with, with, with the pandemic and stuff. And, um, uh, that record now is just kind of in, 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 you know, in, in contrast or, you know, sort of, if you look at that record now with the, it's really, it's really strange to me. Um, but we've, but I think it's kind of to us also is like kind of helped us to keep going through all this shit, you know? Yeah. Um, oh, absolutely. No, I totally get that. It's, it's, you know, you're, you're injecting positivity into something that, you know, commonly, like you said, gets classified as like, Oh yeah, there's nothing, you know, there's, there's no light in here whatsoever. It's like, well, you know, yeah, we're never going to be a pop band, but like, this is a different take. This, this was our take on this, on this realm of positivity. Yeah. Well, and it was, yeah, it was a headspace that we were in at the time as well. 
and are in our and continue to be in and just sort of this realization too, like celebrating life um and the fact that we're still here um and you know we had some we had some uh close friends of ours pass um uh during the time that we were making the record and uh created ron from brotherhood um was one person that passed away and that was really a <clears throat> that was really heavy for us. Um, so there was like a lot of reflection on that too, like, um, and, and thinking about that and that came through in, in the, in the presentation and, um, um, the writing of the, uh, of the album. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, two last things I want to hit on before I let you go was, um, you know, the, the business implications. I know that, you know, clearly like all of the, you know, bands and musical projects that you've played in, like you said, haven't had the ambitions to be like, all right, man, we're going to make it guys. You know, you got stars in your eyes. Like, (laughs) but you know, there, there is that notion that you have to, oh, like I have to talk to the record label and, you know, clearly with what you've built with Southern Lord, there's obviously a lot of business implications there. Um, was that something that you kind of just like grew into with your bands and was something that you, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, unwillingly accepted, or did you kind of like, no, I always sort of like the business of it. I just didn't want to, you know, that to be like my only focal point. What's your relationship with that? Well, I mean, I've always, you know, really been, um, you know, DIY has been an extremely important part of, of my life, you know, um, and whether it's, you know, doing a fanzine or putting on shows or starting your own bands and all that, that, that sort of DIY aesthetic is ex- extremely important. And, you know, back in the early, you know, back in the eighties and, um, doing stuff like it, you would, it, you were your own label. There wasn't very many labels that you, um, that were around. Um, and if you got on a label, it was, you know, it was very rare. And, um, um, but with Southern Lord, it was, yeah, I mean, in the band and the way that the label started was it was started, um, by releasing two bands that Steven and I, um, had been involved in, uh, in Seattle right before I moved, like right near the end of engine kid, I was involved in, uh, a, a band called Thor's hammer and a band called burning witch. And those records basically, um, we made th- those bands recorded and then never, nothing ever happened with it. And there was a few like smaller labels that expressed interest, but it just never happened. It fell through. So it was kind of about taking matters into our own hands at that point. Like, Oh, this is great music that we would like to, that we think should be documented. So uh, let's do that. And so, you know, Steven and I are the ones who started the label and really with the intention of just releasing those, those records um, and, and, you know, had no aspirations or uh, if, uh, for anything after that, really. Um, and then the re- response to those records um, was so, was so positive and people really, really liked it. So we just kind of kept it going, you know, it's like, okay, well let's, let's release something else we like, you know? And sure. um, it ended up being a, a band called the obsessed, which was um, to the members that I was, pl- that I had, st- I had, st- I had moved to Los Angeles after the breakup of engine kid and started a band called goat snake with the rhythm section from the obsessed. And, um, and the singer was, um, Pete Stahl from scream. And he also had a band in the nineties called wool. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, there was all the connections because the bass player Guy uh, of goat snake, he, he had some money. I had no money. And he's like, he's like, Oh, these records are great. You really should put them out. I'm like, yeah, it's, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have any money, man. He's like, Oh, right. I'll, you and what army? Right. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I'll loan you the money. And you pay me back in one year. It's like, okay. So that was the start of Southern Lord. And then we, you know, the third release, um, ended up being, uh, a ba- that band. He was in the obsessed, a collection of like rarities and demos that they had. So, but yeah, it was just like, you know, we, we came out with the first two records and then it was just like, okay, well, we just, kept on putting out records we liked and the label um, started, you know, gathering a a following and people started getting into it and it became inspiring. And like, it's like really exciting to release music that, you know, you, that I thought was really, that should be heard, you know, and it's kind of like when I was a kid, like in getting into punk and hardcore, I got really into um, tape trading. And I had pen pals all over the you know, the whole world, and I would send them, you know, local demos of, uh, you know, the Accused and the Melvins, and then they would send me, 
you know, I'd send that out to New York and then the New York guys would send me, you know, stuff that, you know, local uh, demos of the bands that from their scene. And it was just this whole tape trading network that I was involved in. That was just like, it was awesome. It was an ext- a killer way to, to uh, discover music and, um, and turn people on to music. So with Southern Lord, it's like my kind of philosophy on it is, is, it's kind of how I, or how I look at it is very similar to that. Um, that, uh, the tape trading in the night, in the, in the eighties, you know, of like, I really, this is music that I've heard that I think is, is, is amazing. And I think people, uh, people need to hear this. And, and, and that's the way I look at it, you know, to this day, it's like, I get really excited or hear something that um, blows me away. And it's like, I, I, I like to share that with people. It's like, this is a band people should hear, you know? Um, and really sort of the business part of it, just, we just got, you know, we got extremely lucky, uh, I feel in a lot of ways. And, um, but it, it really, it's like, to me, it's like, if you create something real, people, people know it, you know, people can sense that there's, I think people, the, the bullshit detector in a lot of people, especially in, 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 um, underground music is high and they can, they can tell whether something's real or not. And, and if it's not real, they're not going to back it, you know? And, and I feel like what we put out, it, it is, it's real. It comes from the heart and it, it's, it's the, it's the true deal. You know, this is the, um, and the bands that we work with, it's like the music they create, it, it's, it's, it's in their blood, you know? And, um, and I think that, I think that that's what, um, as a label, that's what, that's what we've been fortunate enough to, um, be a part of. And I think people, you know, people know that. And I think that's what, uh, and I think that to me is, was what is, you know, which you can attribute to our success, you know? Sure. No, I, I totally get that. Yeah. People, like you said, especially within the context of independent music can look, you know, <laughs> they got poser radar pretty quick, you know, <laughs> like, Oh, this yeah. is, uh, I don't know about this. This doesn't seem real. This doesn't seem authentic or whatever. So yeah, I totally get that. Um, I mean, kind of the last thing was you in watching, you know, Southern Lord, uh, you know, evolve and the different releases that you put out, like, you know, you definitely are celebrating a lot of, you know, anniversaries as of late, whether it's, you know, 15, 20 year anniversaries, I know the label is celebrating its 20th anniversary. Um, you know, nostalgia is something that means uh, a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I mean, clearly there's a proper definition of it, but, um, you know, how, uh, you know, I guess how does like looking back versus looking forward kind of like play into, um, you know, what it is you do with the label and then, you know, what it is you do, uh, you know, with your music. I realize that's a big question. No, I, <laughs> I, I like, I like the question. Um, um, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate what I, an answer to it. Um, uh, we love putting out archival releases and it's one of my favorite things to do, um, really sort of to hopefully turn on a new, a new, uh, you know, uh, a new or younger, uh, an audience or an audience that wasn't, uh, wasn't even born when some of these recordings were made and these bands existed and to, um, you know, kind of, you know, to shine a light on, on, on great music that, um, uh, people probably don't have any clue about, you know, a lot. And, and even though that, you know, the internet is, is an incredible tool and you're able to discover a lot of stuff. There's a lot of music from the eighties and well, seventies for that matter. And, um, um, and even the nineties that is just, um, is at the risk of, or has been forgotten. And I, I like being able to, um, feature that and be a part of that. And, and hopefully, and, and really sort of for a lot of our audience, um, people that are into what we're doing, it's the roots of the music of, of current bands that they're into or current, you know, current bands that we might be releasing on Southern Lord. It's like, Oh, well, you know, you like this, you should check out, you know, you should check out this band that was like, this is who, this is who, uh, was influential, um, to this band. Um, so, um, though I love, doing those kind of releases. And then, you know, some of my own music that I've made, whether it's brotherhood. Um, and now with engine kid, it's like, it's exciting to revisit those, um, recordings and, and then also work on, um, you know, sort of, uh, bringing them up, uh, enhancing them sonically, 
uh, with the mod- you know, kind of modern uh, modern technology, or really, a, 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 you know, we've got some um, we've got a mastering engineer that we work with who's just incredible. Um, who's really to me like kind of breathes new lives in new breathes new life into uh, these older recordings um, that we we put out. Um, so, um, but it, it's it's um, you know it's cool. It's a, it's an important part of the label to me. It's the kind of one of the funnest things to be involved in. <laughs> it, uh, um, sure. Sort of it really sort of it really like you know it really like brings me back to when I was younger and really like first discovering this music and getting into it or first discovering a band. So now to be able to like be involved in um, bringing out an archival release of that band and, and being able to talk to some of these guys, you know, for the first time ever in my life that there were people that were really important to me or I looked up to when I was younger, it's really um, exciting to do. And it really kind of keeps me motivated, inspired to keep, um, you know, keep moving on with the label Um, but I think it's, but also the other, the other part of it is I think it's also really important to, um, support and embrace, um, current music and modern music that, um, that I like as well. And I, 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 there's, there's, there's so many great bands. So, um, so it's kind of like, you know, it's a little bit of both, um, for us with Southern Lord. Um, sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, you definitely don't want to be, you, you know, like there are, are, are great labels like, you know, whatever numeral group or whatever that does these really, you know, unbelievable, like they don't traffic in releasing new music, you know, <laughs> they just do these really in-depth documented re-releases or whatever. But <clears throat> what you are attempting to do is, you know, document what's happening now. And then also making sure that I, I do like it from that prism of what you're talking about, making sure that people, you know, kids that are 15, 16, 17 years old now can, you know, hear these things and actually have access to them in ways that they wouldn't have been able to because, you know, they can't pick up a crucial response bootleg or whatever, you know? Okay. No, absolutely. 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 I mean, there's so many more, um, there's so many more tools at your disposal these days for discovering music. It's incredible. I mean, when, you know, when I was a kid, it's like, there was no listening stations and there was no, you know, there, 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 there was nothing. If you, you just like had to, you took chances when you were buying a record a lot of times, unless, you know, it was like somebody that you already liked to do, or, you know, your buddy played it for you, but especially with hardcore and stuff. And like, in, and if there's a small, there wasn't very many hardcore kids and people into the music that I was listening to in Seattle. So you just really took your chances. And I mean, luckily there was an incredible independent, um, store called fallout records that like you know they really had a great selection of 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 underground music and the 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 people that the the couple that owned the store were were super um helpful and really into um you know uh turning people on to uh great music so um but you didn't have you know you know it was really it was really difficult back then to to, to learn about and discover bands. So um, uh, it's amazing now that there's so many things at your disposal and you can just hear anything at any time in any way that you want. Um, I think that's, that's amazing. But I, with that, um, the sort of, there's, there's two things that, that bother me. Uh, one, there's just, there's so much music. It's overwhelming. Um that you know i think a lot of a lot of music gets lost and a lot of this music we're talking about from the you know from the 80s and 90s that southern lord has been reissuing i feel like that has the potential to get to get lost and then i feel like the sort of the hunt for music is sort of gone and that sort of that real that to me the feeling of like you know i remember you know hearing about a record the, the a record brotherhood by dys from from the east coast and like but it was impossible to find in Seattle, Washington, you know, and you spend, you spend, you know, months, maybe years hunting for this record, you know, and then you, you finally get it. But I feel like with the internet um, and all these, everything at your disposal at any time you want, um, we've, we've kind of been spoiled. And so uh, that sort of that search and that hunt and that sort of that feeling you get when you finally you, you finally, you, uh, you find what you're looking for. Uh, that's kind of gone too, you know? Um, sure. But yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's definitely, uh, you know, that, that feeling of 
the uh, whether it's like the collector aspect or whether it's just the you know the physical medium, like you know that that process. Uh, you know, it's still exciting when you do trip onto a new band, you know, on a digital streaming platform or whatever. But it, it definitely, you know, usually from that point, like you know, us old heads, we're like, oh, cool, I found this out. Like, where's their vinyl? <laughs> How can I pick up? Like, where's the shirt? I want the thing. No, and it's cool. You know, it is cool to. I I, I discover bands all the time digitally. You know, it's like, yeah. uh, and you know, uh, follow a thread or a link. Uh, this guy was in this band, and then you did this band, or you know, this this uh, this region had this music happening, and then this, and you know, so you discover all this stuff. I still do that all the time. It's just a different method, and it it's much easier. You know, um, but there is sort of that hunt that is is it's just. It's you're not working as hard for it anymore, you know. Right, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely but, but, passive. But I'm still chasing all the time, and I, I love the thrill of discovering new music. I mean, that's what really keeps me motivated and keeps me doing what I'm doing, and, and is the reason I haven't, you know, given up. Given up is because I just love discovering something and then sharing it with someone else. You know, it's like that's 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 really sort of it in a nutshell for me, as far as Southern Lord. Um, uh, yeah, that's, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. that, that's, there it is. You know, you. that's um, why you're chasing. Yeah. yeah. Well, Greg, thank you so much for hanging out. I really appreciate you letting yeah, me, uh, you know, ping pong around your life and all your musical projects, but uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Dude, this is great. Thank you very much. That was Greg Anderson. Thank you very much to him, and thank you very much to his publicist, Stephanie, a great friend of mine, previous guest of the show. And uh, I love when she brings ideas to me because I always love not only helping her out, but then uh, you know being able to connect with these uh, cool people on this podcast because that's what we do. So next week is a- another legend in my own mind and in many people's minds, Kevin Seconds from 7 Seconds, who uh, are releasing the crew on vinyl and all the digital or download service providers, digital service providers, whatever, all the streaming platforms um, in the next coming weeks. And I was very excited to have an opportunity to talk to him because Kevin Seconds, like, I mean, it's Kevin Seconds. <laughs> that's all I need to say. And I was uh, incredibly lucky to have him on the show. So that's what we got next week. And until then, please be safe, everybody. Explore new cultures and experiences with Intrepid Travel. Intrepid specializes in socially conscious travel with over 900 amazing small group adventures to choose from in more than 100 countries. Whether it's the mountaintop vistas of the Andes, the wildlife of Tanzania, or the hidden noodle bars of Vietnam, Intrepid is there. There to get you off the beaten track, behind the scenes, and totally immersed in the joy of travel. Discover more at IntrepidTravel.com. Intrepid Travel. Travel is back for good. I'm Khalil Gibran Muhammad. I'm Ben Austin. We're two best friends. One black. One white. I'm a historian. And I'm a journalist. And we are back for season two of Some of My Best Friends Are, where we have real talk about the absurdity and intricacies of race in America. Join us as we talk to notable guests like former Attorney General Eric Holder, restorative justice leader Daniel Sered, and other notable people about how to make sense of this moment. Listen to Some of My Best Friends Are on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. How did the online harassment of a Saturday Night Live comedian paved the way to a Trump White House? Or how did people in Georgia use Facebook to run a Black teacher out of town? And what does any of this have to do with our democracy? The answer is the internet. They're all instances where women were targeted by an online hate mob. And this kind of thing has been steadily creeping from our computer screen into our wider political landscape. I'm Bridget Todd, and on my new podcast, Internet Hate Machine, I'll be charting how the harassment and abuse of women and other traditionally marginalized people online has led us to our current political hellscape and what we can do about it. Listen to Internet Hate Machine on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.